listeners, readers, welcome back to the Fox Page uh, lecture on Claire Keegan's amazing Foster. So uh, today in part three of our three-part series, we are going to spend uh, about a half hour talking about figurative language and then the close of the novel. So um, those of you who are longtime uh, listeners and subscribers to the seminars and lectures know that I am pretty picky about my figurative language. My sense is that if it's very well done, it's incredibly meaningful and helpful. But if it is not well done, it just is very jarring. So my sense is any time that figurative language is conspicuous enough to take the reader out of the text, if a metaphor is kind of weird or if you know personification is heavy handed, um, the reader is sort of like focusing on the words and the idea and is, is not sort of swept up in an organic way in the prose. This is a book where it is, I mean, teeming, absolutely teeming with figurative language and never did it feel kind of uh, heavy handed or conspicuous. I just, I honestly can't believe it. I don't think I've ever spent an entire, you know, segment of a lecture on just figurative language. And usually if I would, it would be on like how bad someone's metaphors are. But in this case, it's just an absolute masterclass in figurative language. So we're gonna talk about, let's see, uh, four different kinds specifically, and then a whole melange of all these different ones together. We're talking about pathetic fallacy, symbolism, foreshadowing, and personification. So the first thing is pathetic fallacy, which is just basically when the emotions of a character are um, externalized into nature. So basically like, you know, think Mary Shelley and like thunder and lightning or think, um, you know, that like anytime nature, if, if there's like a drought or something, if there's a major um, or not even major, it can be minor. If there's something that's happening in nature and it's meant to reflect what's happening in the narrative, that is called pathetic fallacy. OK, so on um, page three here, right at the beginning of the book, we have the father, uh, Father John is driving the nameless narrator to uh, her foster home. And she's seeing the, uh, the, the house. On either side, thick hedges are trimmed square. At the end of the lane, there's a long white house with trees whose limbs are trailing the ground. Da, I say, the trees. What about them? They're sick, I say. They're weeping willows, he says, and clears his throat. Oh my God. I mean, it is so, it's so good. And you know what's so masterful? Honestly, I feel like it could be heavy handed, this idea of weeping willows, but how he clears his throat. Like it's just absolutely genius because she takes this and, and, and it's, it I think also doesn't feel heavy handed because we do have this child narrator. It's, um, it, it's maybe one place where it kind of verges on being a little bit twee, like when people report stuff their toddlers say and think are so cute. And I mean, sometimes it's cute, but it, it sometimes can feel kind of too, too, too cute. Um, in this case, it's such a, a beautiful, um, so it's both pathetic fallacy and foreshadowing. It's such a good example. So Weeping Willows, because of their name, but also because of the visual, if you want to see a visual, you can check out, um, my YouTube channel where I have a series of images about this book uh, to, to give you a sense of what well, some of them are, are, are kind of on the nose pictures like the weeping willow, but there are also other images that are a little uh, orthogonal to the text that I think really add to uh, our appreciation of Claire Keegan. But so, you know, the weeping willow could be heavy handed and yet I was totally sucked in. So this is both pathetic fallacy, the idea of these sad trees as reflecting the sadness in the home, but it's also um, it's also symbolic and it's also foreshadowing. I mean, it's literally doing so much work. Okay, um, we're gonna look at page five for some symbolism. We're moving on to symbolism. Oh my God. Okay, this is page five kind of down at the bottom. So this is uh, Edna is addressing our young narrator. The last time I saw you, you were in the pram, she says, and stands back expecting an answer. The pram's broken. What happened at all? My brother used it for a wheelbarrow and the wheel fell off. 
I mean, this is like, again, it could be so heavy handed, but maybe it's because she just keeps doing these things. Like, so, and in fact, it's also so realistic. I mean, this is something that absolutely could happen. So the pram, obviously the perambulator is, is like the baby carriage that you, it's usually for a push chair is more like our stroller. A pram is kind of one of those ones that has like a bassinet on it. So it's for a very small child. And so, you know, and, and in fact, we do know now that there is some relationship between these people. Um, our narrator has no idea who this woman is, meaning she hasn't seen her since she was an infant. But so you have this idea of something that is supposed to keep an infant safe, and yet it is being, um, it's broken. Like literally their family is not able to take care of, of a new baby. They're not able to nurture and keep safe a new baby because there's so many children and things are literally kind of running amok. The other thing here, a wheelbarrow um, would be something, you know, that would be transporting something else. Um, and, and, you know, you can imagine this as being all in fun, but you can also imagine this as like him. I mean, he's a toddler, so I don't think they've put him to work yet. But there is this idea of, you know, of, of using this thing um, in an abusive way. But it's it's meant to be a wheelbarrow and the wheel falls off. So I think this idea of of this family as being so incredibly dysfunctional, like you you really only need the one wheel on a wheelbarrow and that even that wheel has fallen off. I mean, obviously the pram has more than one wheel, but there's this idea of, of nothing working, like even the one wheel that you would need has fallen off. So, and it's also funny um, and there there is sort of a certain warmth. And we also have the sense of our narrator um, as being totally guileless. I mean, this is not a child who is used to small talk. Um, she's not used to pleasing people. She is not used to social interaction. Uh, you know, she's she all she can do is kind of tell the truth. And yet, you know, so much of her is concerned about telling secrets. Okay, we're gonna move on to page seven, all the way to page seven for another, um, oh, this I mentioned yesterday, but we can read it quickly uh, just cause it's so stunning. So um, she is, uh, she's she's reminiscing she's remem she's not reminiscing it's terrible she's remembering being with her mother i feel again the steel teeth of the comb against my scalp from earlier that morning the strength of my mother's hands as she wove the plates tight plaits i always say plates it turns out it's plaits she wove the plaits tight her belly at my back hard with the next baby so gosh i mean this is like a um you know the steel teeth not only steel teeth but against my scalp there's something very like being scalped. There's something re like really uh, kind of menacing about that. And then the strength of my mother's hands as she wove the plaits tight. So her her mother's hands is being very strong, but as, as, but of controlling her and 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 holding things down tightly. Later, when she is being bathed by Edna in that kind of well, it's blinding and it's very much like a rebirth scene in the very, very hot water. We get a sense that she's like never been in bath water that's actually warm. It feels very hot to her. But in the hands, she feels the same strength as her mother, but she also feels something else. And at that point, you're like, ooh, something else. Like, what are we feeling? Uh, but but in fact, I think what she is feeling there is, is deep love and nurturing. Um, and then this idea, I can feel her belly at my back hard with the next baby. So there's this idea of life being hard and her mother as being hard and this idea of being pushed kind of hard off of, of this, this lap, this belly. And in fact, um, I didn't make the connection before, but it's really now, now that I am fairly convinced that Dan is not in fact a predatory male, um, you know, it's juxtaposed this this time when someone is controlling her and not looking at her and um, has, you know, has her back to the mother. Um, it is juxtaposed with the time when she is sitting by the coffin with Dan and is able to really lean into him and feel supported and also to feel like um, he would never want to let her go. You know, that he's very happy having her there. Okay, now we're going to move on from pathetic fallacy and symbolism to foreshadowing. That is on page six. And I'm giving you little snippets, but honestly, um, we could do that parlor game that I used to sometimes do when we were live in the bookstore. I would ask one person for a number and another person for a number, and I would turn to the, the page, and then I would go to that line. And if it were a writer worth her salt, I would be able to, to just spin out some incredible analysis because every single line in a, a given text was that strong. This book is absolutely like that. In fact, I could probably guarantee that I would be able to find some incredible uh, figurative language. 
So on page six here, the foreshadowing, this, this is a bit of a melange though. This is just a, it's a bit of a mixture of several different, um, different things. But what we have here is pretty serious foreshadowing among other figurative language uh, masterpieces. So on page six, a queer ripe breeze is crossing the yard. So, I mean, yikes. Like when I first read that, I'm like, is there, is there like a cemetery? Like what is happening? What's with this queer ripe breeze? And again, this is, a, I think we are reading apprehension into so much of the text because this is a child who is so apprehensive. I mean, this is a child who is looking for danger in the world, I think because she has a lot of danger in her world. I mean, you could, a ripe breeze, I mean, ripe, you could argue it's ripe fruit, but ripe sounds, I don't know, it sounds like something is putrid, you know? So you have a queer ripe breeze. That's again, that pathetic fallacy, but also this idea of foreshadowing because the, the queer ripe breeze is like, you know, a breeze arrives and moves on. So you have this sense of, of being caught up in it in a way that is um, sort of a foreshadowing thing. Come on in. You know how you pronounce this word? It's L-E-A-N-B-H. It's Lianva. No, sorry. Lyanov. Sounds Russian to me. She says, come on in, Lyanov. And Lyanov is Irish for baby. It is also Irish for some sort of restorative bread that you can bake for someone. It, it, as far as I remember, it is the only Irish word in, in, the, uh, in the book. And it's very, very telling that it is this kind of restorative bread and it's pronounced by this woman, Edna, who is this restorative, renewing, um, rejuvenating person. Um, Lyanov also though meaning baby. So this is very much this woman welcoming a baby into her life. She leads me into the house. There's a moment of darkness in the hallway. See, light and dark. We're going from the bright, bright sunlight of the day into the darkness of the house. When I hesitate, there's our, um, you know, there's our hesitancy, there's our, our suspicion. She hesitates with me. Oh my God. Now that is so sweet. When I hesitate, she hesitates with me. We, we, I mean, again, in retrospect and having finished the book once, I, I now can see that we are meant to see her as nurturing, but we also are really meant to appreciate the apprehension of this child. We walk through into the heat of the kitchen. It's not the warmth or the coziness. It's the heat of the kitchen uh, where I am told to sit down to make myself at home. Under the smell of baking, there's some disinfectant, some bleach. So that to me doesn't seem great. I mean, that to me feels like secrets. That to me feels like something we should be suspicious of. Also notably, uh, Claire Keegan is incredibly good at engaging all five senses. If you can work scents and sounds and visions and tactile, what am I missing, um, taste? If you can work all of the five senses into a novella this short and, and do it organically and deftly, that is a serious accomplishment. And here we already, we have this, we have the coolness, we have the, the heat of the kitchen, we have the smell of the, um, the baking, but it's undergirded uh, by this disinfectant. She lifts a rhubarb tart out of the oven. Rhubarb leaves are poisonous, also bitter. I mean, you have to put a lot of sugar with rhubarb in order to, it's also a weed, grows like crazy. Uh, when she hands some to John and he holds it like a baby, but awkwardly, and then he throws it onto the back seat. I mean, John, John is not a great dude. Um, she lifts a rhubarb tart out of the oven and puts it on the bench to cool. Syrup on the point of bubbling over, thin leaves of pastry baked into the crust. A cool draft from the door blows in, but here it is hot and still and clean. Tall ox-eyed daisies are still as the glass of water they are standing in. There is no sign anywhere of a child. Dun, dun, dun. Just kidding. But I mean, almost like that's the kind of suspicion that is building up. And that is the kind of foreshadowing. So this is page six. You know, it's very early. It's only 100 pages long, but, but this is a very early moment. And yet we are really feeling some apprehension here. But again, what's fascinating to me is how, you know, we have all of these different types of figurative language and all of these different senses engaged. It's just a masterful paragraph. It's one paragraph. It's so strong. Okay, then we're going to look um, quickly at two instances of personification. We're going to look at our melange and then the close of the novel. On page 12, personification is tough. I mean, often it feels a little heavy handed, um, but of course she manages to do it. 
um, right here in the middle of 12, a quick line. She says, a type of silence climbs and grows tall between the men while she is out. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous, it's, it's, it's childlike. I'm going to read it again. A type of silence climbs and grows tall between the men while she is out. So, I mean, this is a very good depiction. We don't know what's up between these two men. In the Bible, John and Daniel are very close friends and they're very loyal to each other. Um, doesn't seem like that's the case here. Again, I think John and Mary are both really being written against type here. I mean, I think this is Claire Keegan really um, leaning heavily into some, uh, you know, almost like some sort of, it's not satire, but it's, you know, leaning heavily into uh, a little irony. Maybe it's a little satirical look at the Catholic Church. I think that you could argue that. Um, on page 20, another quick example of personification. Um, here again, the breeze. The breeze is a big player in this book. The breeze crossing the rim of the bucket whispers sometimes as we walk along. So the breeze is whispering now. Again, you would whisper a secret. This idea of whispering something across water when water is very important. We have the boy dying in the slurry tank. Um, and then we have our narrator almost drowning. I mean, we aren't going to talk about it, but how masterful is that climax? It all happens off, off, um, you know, off screen, as it were. She, it's, it's, it's like straight out of a horror film. You know, she's reaching into the well, and and I think that you can imagine this as her reflection, and the hand is reaching up for hers, and then we have no idea what happens. We don't know who saved her, um, but but we, you know, either one of the people. I don't know if it was uh, Edna or Dan, but she was rescued by them, and everything was fine. Uh, so I want to look at this quick melange on um, 49, and then we will look at the close of a novel. Okay, um, so down here at the bottom, I'm mostly just going to read this. Walking down the road, there's, a, there it is, symbolism. There's a taste of something darker in the air, of something that might fall and blow and change things. This is when she's walking away from the wake with the woman who tells her. We pass houses whose doors and windows are wide open. Yikes. I just, for some reason, that's so spooky to me. Long flapping clotheslines, graveled entrances to other lanes. At the bend, a bay pony is leaning up against a gate. But when I reach out to stroke his nose, he whinnies and canters off. That's not good. I mean, that's, you know, she's trying to commune with nature here and, and it's a, it's a pony, you know, it's a little horse and yet he, um, or she wants nothing to do with our sad, poor narrator. Outside a cottage, a black dog with curls all down his back comes out and barks at us hotly through the bars of a gate. Um, the other dog also is barking through the bars of a gate. I mean, there's very much a sense of, of these dogs being imprisoned. Not the old hound, um, but, but these dogs, the black dogs. At the first crossroads, we're at a crossroads here, people. I mean, this is just this incredible melange of all of these different instances of really well done figurative language. At the first crossroads, we meet a heifer who panics and finally races past us, lost. So we see a heifer in the beginning. The father has traded the heifer very much the way he is, or he lost the heifer very much the way he is trading his daughter. Now we see this heifer at a crossroads. Again, this is a young, um, a young female cow. Um, and, and she's racing, just like the birds are racing, just like our narrator is racing. Um, we are very much, I believe, supposed to, cows are a big, big thing. We're very much supposed to uh, see these cows as sort of parallel to our and symbolic of our narrator. Um, and she's lost very much like our narrator is lost, a heifer who panics. So again, I mean, this is page 50. We're right in the middle. If the symbol of our narrator is panicking and is lost, then I think we have every right to think that that threats and danger lurk around every corner. So the, the, the heifer panics and races and is lost. And then we have her um, recurring on page 57. So seven pages later, um, just a very brief mention up at the top here. The same lost heifer is still lost in a different part of the road. So sad. So this is after she finds out, in fact, that, that the young boy, the young son of her foster parents um, 
has has died and died in a tragedy. So um, this idea of of the lost heifer as still being lost, but in a different part of the road. I mean, as I'm reading these things, like I'm, I still don't even think they're remotely heavy handed, but it seems like they should be because they're so incredibly clear and so incredibly well done. And so they map so well onto the psychology of what we are, what we are feeling and what our poor narrator is feeling. Okay. Um, and there is this question of, of, of sort of, so what? So back when you were a sophomore English student in high school and you were learning things like personification and foreshadowing and whatnot, I don't know, maybe they don't even teach that stuff anymore. I don't know how young you are. Um, but when you learn these things, instead of just being able to say, oh, you know, a tower is a, you know, a phallic symbol. It's very important to be able to say, you know, why, like why, so what, so what? There's a lot of uh, really great figurative language. And in this case, I think it's very important to remember that this is a child who is trying to make sense of her world. And it's a child, again, who is incredibly, um, uh, you know, observant and who is highly alert. And so this child is reading everything around her in an effort to figure out where she fits in the world and who she is and what she's all about. So um, if, if you have um, this kind of proliferation of this language, it's because she's looking for meaning all over the place. She's looking for her place in the world. I, I just said all of that stuff. Um, she, she's, she's, and she's struggling to find it. She's really having a hard time kind of making sense of things. So she's looking to sense and smell, smells, sense and smells both. Um, that's the same thing. She's looking to, to breezes. She's looking to the winds. She's looking to nature. She's looking to animals. Um, there's a very childlike uh, sort of overlay to these things. It's sort of like we, we get her perspective and, and what she sees, of course, are the things that children are interested in, which are a lot of animals um, and, 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 and nature and houses and adults. So all of these things, um, as she is making sense of them, she's um, Claire Keegan is offering up these sort of constellations and these these like very multivalent symbols because we as readers are uh, making sense of this world alongside our narrator. It's so well done. Another time that, uh, that, that uh, figurative language is not great is if it's gratuitous and none of this felt gratuitous. Every single thing was either working toward freaking me out and making me suspicious of these, um, you know, potentially gross predatory men or, um, or like like the hand coming out of the well in the horror movie. Um, it was either sort of heightening all of that, or um, which was exactly what it should have been doing because that's how our narrator was feeling, or it was um, giving me a sense of of you know of sort of the depth of her perceptions. Okay, we're gonna go to the very close of the novel. Before we do that, though, I just wanted to uh, do a very quick list of all the things that we did not have time to touch on that I wish we did. And again, this is a, you know, 99 page novel, novella really. And, it, you know, it's very slim and in lots of ways, a lot happens in it. And in a lot of ways, um, is it 97? No, I'm looking, it's 92, it's, it's very brief. But so much is happening on so many different levels and there are lots of small indications of things uh, that we are not gonna be able to look at. So one of them is the timelessness, I mean, apparently it's 1981, it could have been, I honestly feel like it, well, aside from the cars, it could have been 1881. I think there, there's a timelessness to it that I found really haunting and, and very well done. There's a real political heft to it. So again, 1981, they're watching the news every single evening, which you get the sense that wasn't happening in her home, um, her home of origin. But here you had news of, of the hunger strikers. And so you have this real sense of division and colonial oppression, which is, um, it's very important. I mean, I think you can read this whole thing as sort of symptomatic of the troubles. And you can look at the division between John and Dan as potentially, you know, uh, like vestiges of this civil war or maybe active elements of it, who knows. Um, but but we don't have time to look into that. This matrilineal piece of this whole thing and the and sort of this um this idea of, of mothering and motherhood, I think is important. The idea of of her being on the cusp of womanhood, uh, I'd love to, you know, dig even deeper into evidence for her father for um, you know, potentially abusing her and more sort of uh ill doing on his part. 
intertexts. Um, they're, they're actually kind of a large number of, of different books and things that are coming up that we aren't going to be able to talk about. And the gift of reading, there's that beautiful scene uh, where Dan is is helping her learn to read uh, as she's moving along. At first, he's moving his finger along under the words, and then she can do it. And then she doesn't even need to, and she's flying along. She's racing through texts. So he's he's truly giving her the gift of reading, and he's sort of opening up this whole world to her, which it, it, it's just an absolute, like, you know, it's just a little tiny part of the book. And in fact, I think you could almost forget it. But in some ways, it's just really foundational because it does give us, um, a, it's sort of like, it gives us a sense of where all of this erudition is coming from. Uh, and we didn't get a chance to dive into the power of her voice. There's that lovely part. I mean, this I said before that this is a, a little girl who's fairly guileless and isn't afraid to just sort of say things. But um, you, when at one point he asks her to go call, I think like the cows or something, and um, she uses her mother's voice and is very, very loud and is very forceful with her voice. And he's very pleased with her, Dan is. So there is this sense of this child as having voice uh, which we didn't have a chance to look at. Um, again, the idea of the plot and the idea of the climax as being sort of off camera, all of that would have been great to look at. So I mention all of these things simply because I um, the wealth of, of stuff in this novel is just unbelievable. Uh, you know, we're at the close of almost 90 minutes and I feel like we've barely scratched the surface. Okay, speaking of the end of 90 minutes, we are gonna dive in on page 90 um so you know she gets sick when she falls in the well and then that is going to be a secret that she is going to keep from her parents so it's 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 on some level sad that she feels that she needs to keep a secret and yet it's this real sense of empowerment because um you know you have this sense that that in their house there is uh you know in their in the house where she sort of came into her own during the summer in her foster house there is there are you know once the secret is out there is no shame in secrets so there is this idea too of her as as having some some power and some agency okay so her mother is pushing her because her mother wants to know what happened nothing happened this is my mother I am speaking to, but I have learned enough, grown enough, to know that what happened is not something I need ever mention. It is my perfect opportunity to say nothing. So that was advice that she was given by John. And, and he, you know, he gave her the gift of reading, he gave her the gift of speed, the gift of confidence in her running. So you have a sense of, of, of sort of all of these gifts that he gave her as being something that she will keep, um, you know, secret. And then we know that they're driving away. I hear the car breaking on the gravel in the lane, the door opening, and then I am doing what I do best. It's nothing I have to think about. I take off from standing and race on down the lane. My heart does not so much feel that it is in my chest as in my hands, and that I'm carrying it along swiftly as though I have become the messenger for what is going on inside of me. Several things flash through my mind. The boy in the wallpaper, the gooseberries, that moment when the bucket pulled me under, the lost heifer, the mattress weeping, the third light. I think of my summer, of now, mostly of now. Then we skip down a little bit. By the time I reach him, the gate is open and I'm smack against him, Dan. I'm smack against him and lifted into his arms. For a long stretch, he holds me tight. I feel the thumping of my heart, my breaths coming out, then my heart and my breath settling differently. At a point which feels much later, a sudden gust blows through the, through the trees and shakes big fat raindrops over us. So I read this as kind of a, both a, a cleansing and also kind of an anointment. You know, they're anointed um, by by this by this water. Um, also, I think there's a sense of tears. You know, these weeping willows in the beginning are now, um, you know, the trees are, are, are essentially crying with them at, at the fact that they are, are going to have to be separated. When I finally open my eyes and look over his shoulder, it is my father I see coming along strong and steady, his walking stick in his hand, phallic symbol, everybody. I mean, the man is like never without a phallic symbol. I hold on as though I'll drown. Oh my God. I mean, she, you know, she's, she almost drowned. She herself and his son did drown. There's this sense of, of really needing to hold on to him. 
Uh, I hold on as though I'll drown if I let go and listen to the woman who seems in her throat to be taking it in turns, sobbing and crying, as though she is crying not for one now, but for two. So I think she's crying. This is, again, this incredible multivalent sentence here. She's crying for two, meaning that she's crying for the loss of her son. She's also now crying for the loss of her foster daughter. Um, and she's also crying, you know, she's, she's crying for both of the children and then also for herself and her foster daughter. Um, I daren't keep my eyes open, and yet I do, staring up the lane past Kinsella's shoulder, seeing what he can't. If some part of me wants with all my heart to get down and tell the woman who has minded me so well that I will never ever tell, something deeper keeps me there in Kinsella's arms, holding on. Daddy, I warn him. I call him Daddy. Oh my God, you guys, what an incredible piece of literature. So this kind of at the end, um, I love the fact that this last paragraph is bookended by these by daddy and daddy. So she's warning him because her father is coming. Um, and, and it's very clear, father, daddy, I warn him. Um, so, so again, this adds to my suspicion, in fact, that her dad is, I mean, at, at a minimum, he's neglectful and terrible, at, at, you know, but potentially this is someone who is um, doing things to her that she needs to keep secret. And then I call him daddy. She's she's then calling Kinsella daddy. So and I like the idea that um, that this is the second part. This is the daddy that we are ending on. There's this idea of of um, of of really like ownership, sort of a deep sense of ownership. And I think um, meaning that she owns the time in the summer and she has learned her lessons from this this Dan, this strong person who is, um, you know, you know, in the Bible is often with lions and is faithful and is, um, you know, uh, is just someone who has really healed her in lots of ways as he has been healing himself. He's given her, you know, the gift of reading. He's given her the gift of, of you know, he's interested in her. He's talking to her, all these things that were making me suspicious. Um, he has has given her this ability to run and to race, which is something that you, you get the sense that all of these things are going to hold her in good stead. And yet you also have a sense that, that, um, that things are not gonna end well. When you have this daddy and this daddy, uh, the fact that it is ending with the daddy it, that she is calling to Kinsella, to Dan, to her sort of adopted father, her chosen father, you have a sense that she will be able to, uh, to, to retain all of these gifts that he has given her. So I hope that you have enjoyed this 90 minute lecture and I hope that you love this book as much as I do. You know, if I were you, and I probably will take this advice as well. This is a book that that I think you could not reread only once. I think you should reread it again and again and again. It's um it's a book I sense that will keep delivering more and more the more that you read it. And uh, I hope that I've given you some tools to better understand it and and uh, to approach all of your reading with with just a bit more gusto. Okay, so go back to the Foxed page and pick out another lecture that you'd like to hear or uh, jump back into a podcast and read something else with me, um, or read broadly, read whatever you want, but happy reading. <laughs>